Um, has the clock started already? Uh oh. <laughs> um, I don't do a lot of public speaking, and in truth, I'd rather be shot at than stand <laughs> up in front of a lot of people. So I'm just going to try and go with it, and I'm hoping you have a little patience for me. Um, this is a sketch by Howard Brody. Uh, it's now 70 years old. Uh, Brody was a, a combat artist uh, who, th this was done in, in, um, during the Battle of the Bulge. This is a sketch of Private Joe Etz. And Joe and Brody had just assaulted some positions, or Jody was tra Brody was travelling with them as they assaulted some positions. They'd then been forced back from the positions by some German tanks. And Brody did this sketch of, of Joe Etz while they were sitting in a, in a ditch. Even 70 years on, long after Private Etz is now dead, you can still feel the connection. You can still feel the stress that he was under. Brody also did some writing and a little bit of Etz's personality. Etz admitted to Brody at one point, he said that I could never kill a German, I just shoot over their heads and hope they surrender. And that coordination of words and drawing, I think, really paints a picture. Now, Brody was a combat artist in World War II through Guadalcanal, Europe. Um, Korea, Vietnam, he finally packed it up at almost 80 years old, drawing uh, Marines in the Mojave Desert. In uh, early 2002, I was, through poor planning and bad advice, I ended up volunteering to go to Iraq. Uh, <laughs> at the time, Brody was still, was still alive, and I went and spent some time with him. Uh, it was a bit like visiting God. This is a sketch I did, and I think you can, I, I did this sketch of him when I visited, and I think you can tell from this sketch how petrified I was of him. <laughs> he, had, he had these clear blue eyes, and he stared straight at me, and uh, I, I felt like I'd survived the interview more than anything else. But I, le I, left, I left with two things. I left with a pencil that I've used ever since, the type of pencil, and he gave me one piece of advice, which is to draw what you see, not what you feel. Embedding with soldiers is really hard uh, initially because they don't trust you. W when you first arrive on scene, you're just some office jockey and you disrupt everything they've been trained for. Uh, they, they are trained as a unit, they operate as a unit, they're used to protecting one another and suddenly the insertion of you into their world, they're really worried you're going to get one of them killed. So one of the advantages of getting to know them, I should have gotten to this before now, is that they learn to trust you. Uh, this is a sketch of Sergeant uh, Barringer. Uh, this is the night, the morning after they lost two soldiers uh, during an attempt to take a, the other side of a canal. And because I've, they become so used to me being around at this point, me sitting and sketch of him, sketching him wasn't a threat at all. This is another sketch of, pri of Private Troy Turnbull. Uh, he was on convoy the day before, and uh, the convoy was ambushed as it headed through town. And in classic marine doctrine, they head all the way through town on a convoy. And then once they'd gotten through, they realized it wasn't safe to continue, so they turned around and came back through the ambush again in the opposite direction, and were ambushed again and, and had lost the truck. And so this was him, he sat under a, in the shade of a truck and told me the story of what had happened the next morning. The, uh, there isn't a great deal of um, information goes out when you're out there. Uh, we would draw each day when we were in the desert and I would collect stories and do lots of sketches. And each night we would head, I would try and find a moment, usually about two in the morning, to head out into the desert slightly not too far, so I didn't get shot by my own sentries as I came back in, but, but far enough that I could get a signal and we would send out the work each night. And each night they would send us a single file of reader responses. And what we realized from this is that the reader response was absolutely massive. People really attached themselves to the drawings and the stories packaged together in a way that was different from anything else that was going on in the media at the time. People really felt 
said they felt a, a massive connection to the individual people. And, and I think this is what an artist can do that perhaps to a lesser degree a photographer can't do, and that's not to say there aren't some incredibly brave photographers out there. But I think the artist provides a human bridge between what's happening and the people at home, so people have more of a chance to understand what it's really like. Now in Joseph Galloway, who's a, a name you may, we may well not know, um, was one of the last soldiers to fire a weapon in defense of his country, one of the last journalists to fire a weapon in defense of his country. He's the author of We Were Soldiers Once and Young, that famous uh, Mel Gibson movie. He's the journalist in that movie. He met Howard Brody in, the desert in Vietnam in the 70s. And at the time he said he thought Brody was just a stupid old man with his pencils. But he said that, that years on, 20 years on, 30 years on, he realized that when he looked back at the sketches, the sketches had far, far more power over him than the photographs from the same period ever did. It's a sketch of a baptism. It's the back of my head. <laughs> it's a sketch of some Afghans entering a valley on a patrol. Afghanistan's an incredibly hard place to be a soldier, and it's an incredibly hard place to be an Afghan. It's no country to be born a woman. Um, life is just very, very difficult. When you enter as a journalist, you start out in some somewhat cushy hotel in, in Kuwait. And from there you go to a bunk in a tent and you head to a smaller fob. And eventually, if everything goes right, you end up on a cot. And if you go further than that, you end up in a ditch. And by the time you finally reach where you should be in order to tell the stories about real soldiers, a bath is three wet wipes and random people shoot at you periodically. One big base was built into the side of the mountain that I visited. And it was great because it, it looked up the entire valley and you could see it was a main route for the Taliban. So the Canadians and the Americans who were based there could view everything that was coming in and out through that area. Unfortunately, being built into the side of the mountain, it was also a big target for anybody who wanted to shoot at the soldiers on the base. So each night, anywhere between half a dozen or a dozen rockets would come and crash inside the camp. And it, there are times when I, you expose yourself as a rookie just because you are a rookie. You're in an element that you're not supposed to be in. This is not an area for an artist. And I, I discovered that if I walked up the mountain late at night, I could somehow find a phone signal and could call my wife. And one night, as I stood on the mountain with my phone to my ear, I just hit dial, and I was looking out over the valley, and it was light restricted, so all there were were campfires over the village. And I looked out over the village, and I, I saw fireworks in the distance, and I had time just to think, cool, fireworks. And the rocket went over my head and impacted the mountain behind me. And the concussion wave made me want to vomit. And I realized then, you know, you just, you're not anywhere that civilians are ever supposed to be. I am, in fact, that rookie. Now, many, many journalists go there, and many, many journalists do incredible work, and there have been hundreds of Canadian journalists who've headed out there, and many of us have been very, very fortunate, and you can do everything right out there and still die. Um, Michelle Lang would be an obvious example of that. She was a, a great loss to the journalistic community and to Calgary, I think, in general. Soldiers spend a lot of time sitting around, so I get lots of time to sketch them between things. Uh, one day, we uh, lost six soldiers in a single attack, uh, a single detonation on an armoured vehicle. They were killed instantly along with one interpreter. The next day, I was part of an impromptu ceremony at the base where all the 150 Canadians within the base left and came and stood and paid their respects to the, the guys who'd been killed. And out of 150, six is a big death toll. Four years later, the wife of one of the soldiers found this sketch and asked me about it. She just wanted to know more about what things had been like then. I told her what I could, but there wasn't much I could tell. It was just, it was a very hard time. It was a very dangerous time. And so... Four years later, I, I visited her because we were coming to the end of our, our, our active military operation and I wanted to, 
touch on how hard it is on the survivors at home and how, how they manage to, to get by after they've lost soldiers. And she, we spent a, a couple of days together and in the end I didn't have anything to give her. He was just dead. Um, this is a soldier who was almost blown in half in his first week on mission. At the p time of this sketch, he's about 26 days from the end of his rotation. And I think you can tell, or I can tell just through looking at him, there's a certain trepidation to his features. I did this sketch of him while he was on guard duty, 26 days to go. This is Aziz. Aziz is a six-year-old kid. He was, he was shot in the abdomen a couple of times during a firefight. I drew him one day and he was very frightened of me and I drew him the next day but gave him my pencils and he settled down and was quite happy to draw alongside me while I drew him. One of the ways that uh, sketching over photography, I can get things into the newspaper that I couldn't get into the newspaper otherwise. There are certain things that are hard for people to look at and there are certain things that newspapers shy away from publishing. But something like this, which is uh, an Afghan soldier who's just gone through surgery this is the kind of thing that I can get in the paper with a drawing that I could never get in if it was a photograph. Visiting the wounded of our own is, is always a challenge for me. I always am very intimidated when I go and visit them because it, it's, it, the, it's harder almost than being in the field because I'm entering a world of hurt and I never ever want to feel like I'm taking from someone who's already been hurt. And yet at the same time, these are the stories that I feel that people need to look at. These are the stories that I think that people need to see the actual damage down the road after the conflict is over. So I always have great trepidation when I enter these situations, and these are Canadians and American boys, and yet in almost every situation, when I get myself over the mental hurdle of worried about being worried about how I'm going to upset them or how I'm interfering in their pain, I find out that in actual fact they, they're more than welcome they, they're desperate to tell their stories. They really want to let people know what they're going through. And they really want to know what the sacrifices have been. If I can then, I, I, I was going to finish on by reading you, as, as, I, as I said, with Bro oh, I need to go back to that if I can. Oh, good. W one of the things that Brody did so well was he packaged his writing with his readings at the same time, with his, with his drawings at the same time. So this was a, a sketch I did after my first ramp ceremony. And I'm not sure if everybody knows what a ramp ceremony is. I'm sure you all do. But just in case you don't, a ramp ceremony is the process in which the, the body of the deceased soldier is transported from the battlefield or wherever he's been laying onto a plane to bring him home. So what I wanted to do is have you hopefully have a look at this piece of art and listen to the journal piece that went along with it. Um, you're more than welcome to close your eyes. You're more than welcome to stare at the piece. And uh, I'll read this in a Scottish accent. <laughs> it's one o'clock in the morning. A Canadian herc stands ready with its ramp down on Kandahar airfield. A ritual is about to be played out. It is pitch black beyond the lights of the runway. Flights are suspended. It's eerily quiet. Grasshoppers litter the ground and fly clumsily in the wind, in and out of the fluorescent lights overhead. A thousand servicemen and women form up and country by country march into place, flanking the rear door of the plane. German, British, Dutch, American, Australian, Canadian. They position themselves to pay their final respects. The uniforms are different, but the aspect of every individual is the same, stoic. There's a sudden boom and a flare lights up the desert beyond the wires. The breeze shifts it in the sky from left to right. Everyone's eyes shine. And we wait. Grasshoppers dance among us. A Canadian flag bearer stands at ease, staring straight ahead. And we wait. The flare drifts to the ground. There's an engine noise and a Canadian lav rumbles onto the runway, circling the plane and the assembled mourners in one slow, steady motion, coming to rest at one end of the funnel of soldiers. The pastor speaks. He speaks of loss. He speaks of sorrow. He speaks of loyalty. He speaks of God. He speaks of absent friends. He speaks of families smashed. He speaks of death and an end to pain. 
The bagpipes begin. The group comes to attention and the flag, now released by its bearer, flutters out and back, out and back. Through its passage moves the casket, borne by eight soldiers, who stride slowly forward in lockstep, arms around one another's shoulders, in support of their mutual burden, their mutual friend. The walk is precise and slow, they move as a unit, only at the last, as they ascend the ramp, does the weight seem to sh settle on their shoulders. But as a unit, they push through. Corporal Darrell Caswell is on his way home. I guess what I hope you get from this is that the war zone is a ridiculous place to send an artist, but at the same time, it's an essential place to send an artist. Thank you. <laughs>